could see these creatures and, and, and realized where I was. That was the, the, gr the greatest shock. These two lights were attached to a grey dumbbell shaped object which was above the road. It's been estimated since that it was 50 feet wide and 100, about 100 feet above the road. A large grey jelly mould shaped metallic object hovering a few feet of of the ground. Well, I tell you, they flew like, erratically like a, like a saucer would if, it, if you skipped it across the water. And of course then, all of a sudden, uh, the term flying disc and, and this type of thing, or crescent shaped or whatnot, it was completely dropped and everybody started seeing flying saucers. And they've been seeing them ever since. Normal people reporting something extremely strange. What is the truth about UFOs? In this program, we investigate. We inquire into some of the most convincing and some of the most extraordinary UFO claims. Sightings, encounters, even abductions by aliens. We put these claims under the microscope and ask, how credible are the witnesses? How probable are the various explanations? Focusing mainly on sightings and incidents here in the UK, we seek to discover the truth about the UFO experience. A worldwide phenomenon dating back through time, strange apparitions in the sky have always fascinated human beings and have become part of myth or history. Think of the Magi following the star to Bethlehem, or Halley's Comet appearing as a portent of disaster to the English, faced by the Norman invasion of 1066. Until we can make sense of the phenomenon that surrounds us, we live in ignorance. If you think about it, the, the sort of first cavemen crawling out of a cave and looking at a rainbow wouldn't know what it was. And it would be thousands of years before they had any kind of physics or science to understand what a rainbow was. So that was, for a long time, to humanity, a UFO. And today, we face the same sort of thing, modern-day equivalents of rainbows, just strange phenomena in the sky, which probably one day will have a, an adequate natural scientific explanation. The ancients gave to the inexplicable a religious or superstitious meaning. In our own era, the strange power of the UFO over our imaginations continues. The unexplained holds us in its grip. What does the rational mind make of the contemporary evidence, including film, photograph and eyewitness testimony tested by polygraph lie detector? Can it all be true? Can it all be false? We're assuming that it has to be either black or white, real or unreal. And we've done that too often in the past, not to learn from that lesson and realize that probably what we have to do here is dispense with that artificial definition, which is very hard for us to do because we're ingrained into thinking that way, but which physicists are gradually coming down around to understand is the only way we'll actually comprehend the universe. Everything they've discovered about the nature of quantum reality as they've dug deeper and deeper into the nature of the atom has been that what we consider as solid physical space, like the chairs we're sat on or the floor that we stand on, is in fact not solid at all. It's 99.999% empty air, and it's literally a mass of swirling energy. And that energy somehow creates an illusion of physical reality. So as we learn things like that, we know that it's artificial for us to assume that there has to be a simple distinction between real and unreal. So, let us start our investigation into the real or unreal UFO phenomenon. Take this ordinary stretch of farmland at Cuddington between Tame and Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. Not an out-of-the-world location, but here in this cosy English landscape at 9.30am on the 11th of January 1973, Peter Day, a building surveyor, one of many UFO witnesses in the UK over the past 45 years, saw this and he managed to film it. Like many such examples of UFO sightings which have been filmed or photographed, it's perhaps inconclusive. But what of this footage, captured by a professional ATV cameraman and broadcast on national TV in 1971? 
It's been suggested that both of these sightings are jet fighters dumping fuel. But compare the footage with these Australian Air Force photographs of F-111s carrying out the dump and burn procedure. And how about this extract from an extended filmed sighting of a yellowish craft captured in this footage by a Dutch holidaymaker, Dr. Heister. He was in Spain at the time. The witness's family and many local people claimed to have seen the craft also. Near panic was reported as the object hovered for nearly an hour. And it's not just humans that see UFOs. Look at this series of shots taken by an automatic car park security camera on the 26th of April 1991. The eerie object marked in this sequence is quite inexplicable. This footage was taken recently in Warminster. The object seems to be semi-transparent, but as with all photographic evidence, one has to exercise caution. How do you react when faced with filmed evidence like this? skeptic or believer where do you fit on the ufo witness spectrum because in the last five minutes you have yourself just witnessed a number of ufos with your own eyes it may be just coincidence but at the very moment the human race developed the rocket technology required to begin the great adventure of space exploration at the very moment we built the capability to reach out into the solar system and into the universe beyond, from that very moment, beginning in the mid-40s, the evidence began to mount that perhaps the aliens were already here. Or did our awareness of our own growing ability to leave planet Earth merge with Ken Arnold's new flying saucers and a sackful of popular Hollywood B-movies to convince the susceptible few among us that aliens do exist. We live in a world where science fiction has a habit of eventually becoming science fact. And there's no doubt that the UFO phenomenon is taken seriously, treated as fact and not fiction. It reports that to be believed in even the highest places. And there's no question that for many UFO witnesses, the experience is real enough and has in many cases radically changed their lives, literally out of the blue. The modern UFO story took off in 1947 at Chehalis Airfield, Washington State. Search and rescue pilot Kenneth Arnold found something he did not expect. At this point is when I uh, would say approximately is where I had this terrific flash, hit the air, my aircraft lit up the inside of my aircraft, and uh, I, I assumed, of course, at the time, in a, in a split second, that it was probably a P-51 fighter that it dove over my nose and that it was the sun's reflecting upon his bright wing surfaces that caused it. However, before I gathered my wits together, I looked way off here to the north, and that's when I saw where the flash came from. It was a, an echelon formation of a very peculiar looking aircraft, and uh, they were rapidly approaching Mount Rainier, and it was at about this point when I got here, I could see their, their uh, tail surfaces, or the rear end of them, and, and the, second, uh, the second craft from the rear had a more or less crescent shape uh, look and it had a hole in the center of it and of course I kept mulling in my mind that's the damnedest looking airplane I ever saw above all it was the sheer speed of the craft that convinced Kenneth Arnold that this was not your average airplane I looked at my uh, sweep second hand on my 24-hour clock and they had covered this distance of approximately 50 miles in a minute and 42 seconds it is placing their speed at uh, approximately uh, 1,700 miles an hour, 1,781 it came out at, at that distance, uh, which was, of course, unheard of in 1947. Soon after his experience, Kenneth Arnold told his story to the media. His description of what he saw was to become legendary. I says, well, I tell you, they flew like, erratically like a, like a saucer would if, it, if you skipped it across the water. And, of course, then, all of a sudden, uh, the term flying disc and, and this type of thing, or crescent-shaped or whatnot, it was completely dropped, and everybody started seeing flying saucers. And they've been seeing them ever since. Seeing them, yes, and researching them, too. A huge research literature has been produced since 1947 to add to the mass of imaginative science fiction novels, films, and TV that have colored all our ideas of what worlds beyond our own may be like. But how did modern UFO research get started? 
Back in 1952, Albert Bender in Bridgeport, Connecticut, founded, I think it was about April, the International Flying Saucer Bureau. And the remarkable thing was that within a very short space of time, he had acquired 600 members in no less than 48 states with branches in Britain, France, Australia, and New Zealand. The British Flying Saucer Bureau wasn't in fact the first UFO club in the UK. There was the Flying Saucer Club of Hove with which it merged, and they jointly published Flying Saucer News. In fact, Flying Saucer News was latterly incorporated into Flying Saucer Review around about 1956. They took over the mailing list, so that was a bonus for Flying Saucer Review. Alongside the growth in the number of informal societies studying the UFO phenomena in Britain in the 1950s, there was also plenty of activity across the Atlantic. The US Defense Department took the issue so seriously that it set up a major UFO research project. It was known as Blue Book. One of the key members of the Blue Book research team was J. Allen Hynek, a noted astronomer. He was a professor at Harvard and Northwestern universities. Professor Hynek was to become a key figure in ufology. The Air Force had hired me with the expectation that I would clearly be a debunker. And I proved quite successful in debunking, if you will, and the Air Force was pleased. Of course, it is easy to debunk UFOs if you concentrate on IFOs. <coughs> Identified to start with, he was a skeptic on the extraterrestrial hypothesis because of more than 12,000 UFO sightings reported to Blue Book, under 6% remained unexplained, and of these there was no positive evidence of alien involvement. But by 1973, his Blue Book research led him to change his position dramatically. He became a strong ETH proponent, declaring that Blue Book had been a cover-up all along, a Pentagon plot to damp down legitimate public concern and that it was possible that some UFO incidents were attributable to alien visitation. I remember being in a meeting in 1979 with something like 40 ufologists from different countries around the world where we formed an organization called the International Committee for UFO Research. At this meeting, we spent something like three or four days discussing probably better described as arguing about classification systems, where eventually we all agreed Hynek's classification system was probably the one we should use. The six-point Hynek classification system, which includes close encounters of the first, second and third kinds, covers those UFOs that remain UFOs after careful study. Most sightings that start out as UFOs do turn out to have a definite explanation, making those that don't even more intriguing. A very small proportion of UFO reports turn out to be deliberate hoaxes. The hoax. There was a celebrated instance in the 1960s, here in the market town of Warminster in Wiltshire. It's what every researcher has to be most careful about, a category of UFOs ignored in the Hynek system, but one which clouds the issues more thoroughly than a blurred photograph or even unconvincing witnesses. In January 1992, I was contacted by a chap called Roger Hooton, who had been living in Australia for 26 years. And he had just got a copy of my book where he had seen a photograph allegedly taken by Gordon Faulkner of a flying saucer over Warminster. And it had been spread across the centre pages of the Daily Mail, and it was dubbed The Thing, the first photograph of The Thing. It was a very big splash, and it really did start the Warminster phenomenon off in many ways. Although there had been reports prior to that, this was the thing that brought it to public attention. It was a joke on the owner of the Warminster Journal, which was the little local paper, and apparently that it, it was thought that that owner would have known that it was a joke too, but he played along with it. It was a local town gag. And, uh, th and basically, yes, this, this massive thing which had kicked off the whole UFO phenomenon was a fake, and it was a, a two-inch wide model made of milk bottle tops and buttons and so on and thrown up in the air at a completely different time to the time given in the newspaper. And, and it's, it's sad that 26 years of research didn't spot the fact that if you just look in the newspaper that the photograph's in, it says that the photograph was taken at 8 o'clock in the evening or whatever it was, I think. And if you go three, four pages forward, you can see that sunset in that area was about an hour earlier. And there was no way that that particular camera could ever have taken that photograph and yet 
all the research on the subject, never found that in 26 years. After that, cases like that usually didn't pass through the filter and we rejected them out. But we got more and more complex types of photographic hoax, which eventually we got new techniques to deal with. When the deep space probes into um, planets like Jupiter and Saturn were launched, where you could send a camera, but you couldn't bring the camera back to Earth, you had to find a way of sending those pictures back. And the only way they could do that was by turning them into a kind of electronic signal and then reprocessing that electronic signal into a picture back in the laboratories of NASA. Now, we can use the same methodology to turn ordinary photographs into electronic pictures and then reconstitute them into better pictures by enhancing certain parts of them. And these computer enhancement techniques have become a real godsend to UFO investigators now because the more sophisticated hoaxers find it very difficult to get through that barrier. But what happened here in Warminster in the mid-1960s led to almost mass hysteria. It started back in Christmas 1964 with various people reporting strange lights and sounds, particularly sort of hammering, hammerings on roofs and alleged reports of dead birds and animals found in the fields. There was quite a lot of um, hysteria at the time. And I can actually remember, I think it was about August 1965, attending a meeting in the town hall of Warminster. And 200 people packed into this small town hall. Dr. Geoffrey Dole, our then, I think, chairman, was on the stage. And uh, Geoffrey said, well, we must reassure people that um, there's nothing to worry about as far as the UFOs are concerned, and as an aside to me afterwards, he said, well, what else could we say? <laughs> um, the, the phenomena carried on for quite a number of years. But was it really all a hoax? They'd gone around the field collecting up uh, dead rats, which you find apparently in fields. I'm not a country lad, but I gather there's a lot of them around. And they lined them all up in a dead straight line across the field, set light to the lot, and all ran out the field shouting, there's a UFO just taken off, and left it to everybody else to make the obvious conclusion. So I suspect somewhere is the, is the first animal mutilation UFO story. But the number of proven hoaxes is tiny compared to the vast number of credible reports from sober, sensible witnesses. People who, as Heineck argued back in 1973, would prove excellent, reliable witnesses in a court of law. Mrs. Josephine Hewinson certainly had an unusual encounter one morning. She was looking out of a bedroom window, uh, which faces towards a fir tree and a paddock and a greenhouse, quite a large greenhouse. And between the greenhouse and the fir tree, she said she saw a large, grey, jelly mould shaped metallic object hovering a few feet above the ground. Well, naturally, she wanted to go and get confirmation, so she looked for her husband. Of course, when her husband came, the flying saucer had disappeared. Um, but she was a very sound and sober lady, um, Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. No, nothing to particularly gain from making up such a weird story as this, and it sounded highly believable. You will find within cases that there are tiny points which stand out, things I call the pink frog factor. Because if you were to imagine two people who were seeing the same car, if they were to describe it to you as having been uh, blue with four wheels, it wouldn't help you recognize whether or not they'd actually seen the same car, because an awful lot of them are blue, and all of them have got four wheels. So what you have to look for is something that's special, a little feature that stands out. And if they both said they saw this little bottle pink frog hanging from the back window, you'd immediately get a hint that maybe they did see the same thing. And we find this in the abduction cases, things which don't tend to get reported and that most people therefore are not aware of, as they would be aware of the common stereotype image of the little grey entities with big eyes, because that's become so well featured in movies and TV series. Things like being offered a small drink which tastes like salty lemonade, which crops up again and again in cases from places as diverse as Russia and England and uh, Australia and America, uh, which you never find reported, but which witnesses are telling you as part of their story. But the most controversial testimonies come from the small number of witnesses to second and third kind encounters, which leave physical evidence or where actual contact with an extraterrestrial is claimed. I suddenly felt a tightening sensation around my head. It was as if there was a band of something round there which was tightening and I felt that I was going to faint. I thought that it would be wiser to faint inside the restaurant than outside and I sat down and waited. 
It lasted about a minute. It went off and all was well. Um, it was just as if nothing had happened and I paid the bill and we left and I completely forgot about that. At 5.15 in the afternoon, it was time to go home. When I arrived at Weedon Crossroads, I turned right onto the A5 and immediately saw a brilliant red light on the left-hand side above the road and a brilliant green light on the other side. My thoughts were that it was an aircraft which was going to zoom over my head and crash. But the other traffic went slowly, I went slowly at the same pace as them because it was a busy road and I realised soon that this, these two lights were attached to a grey dumbbell shaped object which was above the road. It's been estimated since that it was 50 feet wide and 100, about 100 feet above the road. And I went along and, of course, had to drive underneath it. As I went along the road then towards Churchstow, where I live, I could look back and I could see this was still there and the lights were flashing, the green light was still flashing and the red light was not. The next part of the road was covered with trees and I remember driving under the trees. But when I came out from under the trees, well, I don't remember coming out from them because suddenly the car was stationary, everywhere was black, real pitch black, and I didn't know where I was. I knew I was in the car because my hands were on the steering wheel. I couldn't see the road, the trees, the buildings. I could see absolutely nothing, not even the car I was sitting in. And, of course, I sat there and wondered where I was. I wasn't afraid in any way at all. Um, just wondered where I was. And suddenly, a brilliant white circle of light about a metre across shone on the road to the side of the car. And it went off and everywhere was black again. And then another circle of white light, exactly the same as the one before, shone uh, just towards the front of the car. And they went on and off, on and off, in a circle, round the front of the car. And then they went back in a semicircle, round to where they started, on and off, on and off, and again, in the same way, to, to my side of the car. And this one shone in the garden of a cottage on the right-hand side. It was then as if it was turned, and it went up the front of the cottage and off the top. I sat there thinking, these lights must have come from above because they were completely circular, but there were no beams. So they, I, but I couldn't see anything. I didn't know um, why they'd come, where they'd come from, or what. And as I sat thinking about this, suddenly I was about 30 yards further down the road, driving in third gear quite normally, as I had done or had been doing at the end of the trees. My journey had taken 30 minutes and it should have taken 15. Somewhere along the line, presumably while I sat in the car, I'd lost 15 minutes of time. Elsie Okinson's case is very important in the UFO field for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, when she had her experience, of which she remembered very little consciously, but there was a gap, a time lapse as we call it, and that that was subsequently explored under hypnosis. She came out with a crucial piece of information, which was that basically she'd been scanned and rejected by entities who were involved, presumably, in the experience. Now, that matches something which has occurred in a few other cases around the world and which we're beginning to be noticing as a trend, although when her case was investigated by us back in 1978, when it happened. Um, this trend was totally unknown. In fact, several of the cases which are now part of the trend hadn't even happened. So it's totally independent testimony of a phenomenon which we now recognize as real and important. Four women in a car at a village called Preston Capes, which is about four miles from Church Doe, where Elsie lives, were driving to a meeting in Northampton when they also saw almost exactly the same thing that Elsie had seen about an hour and a half, two hours earlier. They described it as projecting beams of light down onto the car, and the car engine and its lights began to falter and fade. As is often the case in these experiences, there was a kind of blink in reality, and then the thing disappeared and the experience was over. I talked to the witnesses, or I tracked a couple of them down, to see if they'd be prepared to explore this case further, because obviously there was a possibility that there was missing time here. They didn't remember whether there was. 
and, and that if we explored it under hypnosis, it was conceivable that we may have found deeper memories there. But they were absolutely against that. They did not want to explore this any further. They preferred to forget all about it, as many witnesses do, and just wish that it never happened to them. It was a, an incident in their lives that was something they did not want to think about. We saw a large uh, glowing object hovering in the sky near the road there. Uh, Mike here was driving. He uh, stopped the truck. Somebody yelled out to stop the truck. And as soon as he did, uh, I got out and started towards this thing. I was thinking that uh, it was just something that I was going to catch a glimpse of and it would be gone as quickly as I got up to it. But as I started towards it, the, the rest of the crew were, was started screaming at me to get away from there and get back in the truck. And uh, I, I was scared too, but you know, I, I was curious and uh, I, I con continued towards it and uh, just as I got up closer to it, it, the sound that it was making suddenly got more powerful and uh, it started to rise up. And uh, that scared me and I jumped down behind the end of a log that was sticking up there trying to get some cover and uh, I decided I'd you know, better get back in the truck and get away from there. And I raised up to go and at that instant uh, I felt something hit me. It felt like I'd been hit by a truck. It, it was just uh, a really powerful jolt, like uh, an electric shock, and I blacked out. What we saw was uh, like an energy beam, or, or it had been described as several things by the guys that were in the truck there uh, with me, but uh, it was like a, a straight-sided bolt of energy. It could have been like lightning, electricity. It could have been who knows what it was is the point. Uh, we've tried to describe it, and I even painted a, a, a picture of it to, uh, to visualize it. But uh, whatever it was, it hit him with enough impact that it blew him back, knocked him back through the air, like, uh, like as if a, a hand grenade or an explosion had gone off in front of him. And uh, he flew through the air there and, and landed on his back uh, limp you know, just like he was unconscious before he hit the ground. And uh, this whole thing was so frightening uh, to begin with that I had turned the truck back on right before that happened. And uh, when, when he was struck and, and hit the ground like that, I mean, it was, it was just panic. Uh, I just panicked. And the guys in the truck were, were panicked, too, because they were yelling at me to go just at the same time I was doing so on my own and I hit the gas and, and we tore off down the road and uh, it took me about a quarter of a mile uh, before I could get my thoughts together and and uh, realize that we had left Travis back there uh, and just left him to his fate I guess you'd say uh, and I stopped the truck and and the group of us not all of us but most of us got out of the truck and had a very uh, excited, hectic uh, sort of discussion there. We could not explain what had just happened. Uh, and the whole thing was so frightening and, and unexplainable that our, that our minds were just whirling. I mean, literally uh, couldn't, couldn't understand anything about it. Uh, but we did realize that we had left him back there and, and that we should go back. And, and just as we had made the decision to go ahead and return, uh, getting into the truck, we saw this uh, thing from a distance, from a quarter mile away, lift up through the trees and, and streak off to the northeast. And, you know, that made it certain to me that it was safe to go back. So we went back. Uh, I took the light and I, I shone it down there on the, on the ground to see if, if there was anything, any footprints in the road. And when I did, I saw the footprints where he had jumped out of the truck and, and his heel mark was very plain there in, in the dirt. We followed the footprints on up to where he had stood in the middle of this clearing and could not find the footprints, uh, anything where he had walked away from there. And uh, I checked very closely. And uh, from that, uh, we had deducted that uh, he didn't leave the spot 
under his own power. I regained consciousness in a, in a very <coughs> small space. It was dimly lit. Uh, I was in a great deal of pain. I felt trapped. And I was having a great deal of trouble breathing. I, I, the atmosphere seemed hot and uh, humid and, and stale. Uh, I couldn't catch my breath. Travis claims that he met two different types of aliens. The first were the greys, creatures about four feet tall with large domed heads and huge eyes, characteristic of many American abduction testimonies. The second type were the Nordics, tall, blonde, human-like aliens. After lashing out in fear at the greys, Travis claims he was taken into another room by the Nordics and then anaesthetized. It was just a matter of minutes uh, from the time I regained consciousness and uh, saw them and, be and became hysterical like that until I was forced down on a table and a mask was placed over my face and I, and I blacked out. Abductions have the appearance of being an entirely American phenomenon because I think there are probably more UFO researchers per head of population in America than anywhere else in the world. What we do know is that you will find abduction reports and UFO reports anywhere that there are channels to report them. So when you look at a map of the world and find the spots where there are no UFO reports, what you usually find is there are no channels for communication. There's an amazing case from Australia where a woman who'd had repeated abduction experiences actually felt one coming on again and she contacted two UFO investigators who went round to her, drove with her out to the location where she'd had her earlier contacts, and as she was actually describing to them, again in an altered state of consciousness, how she was now inside the UFO, seeing these entities and the constructions inside the machine, they could see her wandering around outside the car, speaking into thin air, apparently seeing entities that they could not see. So we have evidence like that which suggests that the experience is, is real to the witness who's having it, but not real to you or I if we were there at the same time. False memories or true accounts? We've heard some compelling testimony, seen some very mysterious sightings, heard from some of the leading UFO researchers, evidence conceivably that creatures from up there have come here. But if we doubt the extraterrestrial explanation, is there another good way to account for all these sightings and testimonies? There are many and very varied theories of UFO origin split down into four broad areas. The first of these areas could best be described as UFOs are advanced technology. For example, there have been many reports recently of strange delta-winged objects Many people feel that these are top secret American spy planes. Also within the advanced technology group, you would include things like UFOs as extraterrestrial vehicles. The second group of theory relates to UFOs may be psychic phenomena, something along the lines of ghosts, if you like, that effectively UFOs may be the equivalent of the 19th century materializations. The third group of theories relates to UFOs may be some form of psychological or physiological process. The best description, I guess, is that UFOs may be some form of hallucination. The fourth group of theories are that UFOs might be some form of natural phenomenon. This might be a pre-existing phenomenon, for example, ball lightning, or it might be some new form of previously unreported atmospheric phenomenon. So, either we are being visited by aliens, or it's some kind of trick that our minds or our bodies are playing on us. Then again, Maybe it's just a natural phenomenon that we don't yet understand. How can we decide which explanation fits the bill? How can we make this decision objectively without letting our own ideas, our own emotional baggage cloud the issue? We were imposing the belief systems of the researchers and the investigators on the stories that we were being told. Um, and that was a factor also of using hypnotic regression and 
a stereotype abduction created from the Betty and Barney Hill encounter. What had happened was in the 60s, Betty and Barney Hill had been driving alone. They'd been abducted by a, or at least they perceived they'd been abducted by a flying saucer. They'd actually had some kind of confusing drive time. Something had happened to them. There was physical evidence that something had happened to them. Um, then, after about three or four days afterwards, Betty Hill was very absorbed reading Donald Kehoe's work. Uh, about five days after that, roughly speaking, in, in numbers of days, within the ten days of the sighting anyway, she was having very elaborate dreams about this abduction experience of being a landed flying saucer, taking her and her husband aboard and doing these medical things. That was revealed under hypnosis around two years later, and the hypnotist did not say that he believed it was... The, the, the magic and royal road to truth was the expression. He said it's not, hypnosis is not the magic and royal road to truth. But nonetheless, it, um, it was thought provoking and it was possible, of course. And I think abduction researchers were drawn into the subject by the attractiveness of this ex exciting science fiction story. And I must say, I think that, that that is not an accidental phrase. There's a lot of American science fiction culture has gone into building this story up. Every research experiment that's been carried out into the regression hypnosis, both in UFO-related and non-UFO-related situations, has demonstrated that it is fallible. It can produce useful information, it can stimulate memory, but at least as often it can stimulate fantasy. The upside of hypnotic regression is it's an extremely reliable form of therapy, and I've spoken to many witnesses who believe it saved their life. Um, Bart Hopkins' principal witness of his book, Intruders, Debbie Tomey, Kathy Davis in the book, uh, spoke to me and, and she was talking to me about the fact that she would have committed suicide possibly or she thought she might have done if Bud hadn't helped her and her family through the experiences. And I have no doubt that, that as therapy it's very effective. But as therapy it allows people to work out fears and fantasies as well as, as true trauma. And there is no way that the person in that experience can tell themselves what is real and what is not. And as a research tool, I would say it was totally useless. I can talk first-hand here because I've actually gone through regression hypnosis. I wouldn't personally have been involved in any research talking about regression hypnosis unless I'd experienced it myself. So I worked for six months with a, a clinical psychologist who took me back to a very minor light-in-the-sky experience that I had in 1978, which I'm absolutely certain was nothing strange about it at all. But I went through regression hypnosis to experience what it was like to relive the memories and also to see what happened afterwards because he told me that quite likely I'd dream about it and things would begin to crystallise in my mind and I have all kinds of strange images coming to me. But more importantly than that, because although I had no conscious recollection of the hard facts about this experience, like the day of the week on which it occurred or what I did the day after it or anything like that, I knew that that information was available and with some research I could find it. So it gave me an objective test in a UFO real situation of the validity of regression hypnosis. And I found that approximately 55% of the information that I came up with under these regression hypnosis sessions for this clinical psychologist were completely wrong. We've done some experiments uh, which, are, uh, which were videoed throughout with no breaks so that we knew there was no manipulation with several witnesses using clinical hypnotherapists and a whole team who um, learnt about a non-existent race of aliens. And we can see on that video, in the first case, uh, Tony Wells is the subject, and he is recounting an abduction which took place on Canary Wolf by aliens from a flying saucer from Venus, uh, sort of from Jupiter, sorry. Something which he'd learnt, and he is able to elaborate on that and answer all the questions. And as you can see, he's quite convinced of the experience he's going through. In fact, it's totally fictitious, and we all knew that from the start. Uh, there was even some subjective stuff came in because one person in the in in our group came in during the hypnosis. In fact, while while as far as I know, Tony Wells had his eyes closed, who was wearing cowboy boots, and suddenly one of the aliens turned out to be wearing cowboy boots as well, and it was obviously something that Tony had picked up in, in that way. I would say it was obvious, I think that's, that seems clear. In the second experiment, we can see Anise, um, who is being turned around under hypnosis. She experienced a very bad, frightening, evil abduction, all totally fake, because she learnt it all for us beforehand. But she is experiencing it just as she is experiencing it real, under the hypnosis, but by using some suggestive yes. language and some suggestive body language, in fact, we were able to imply a spiritual dimension to what was going on. We didn't ask her to, to interpret it that way, we implied it. And very quickly, we can hear Anise beginning to accept that this is a lovely experience, a religious experience. And it's very clear that the approach that we make affects the research. But what does an abductee such as Travis Walton have to say on the subject? 
Was he conditioned by his hypnotist when he underwent regression? You know, the memory of what I, I see, I wasn't familiar with, with the subject at all. And uh, the, the description that I gave uh, had come out in little bits uh, prior to the hypnosis. So it wasn't like anybody could suggest that the hypnosis, if that's what's being implied there, that, that uh, somehow a, a bad hypnotist could inadvertently guide someone to see these sorts of things. But I, I, that just doesn't hold up in my case. There is a belief that the, the UFO phenomenon is a very nuts and bolts thing, that it's the visitation of aliens from another planet. And of course, if that's what it is, then it is in fact just uh, a phenomenon in which we have no control. We can observe it like a firework display and we can uh, see what happens as and when it happens. I don't personally believe that's true. I have found so much in close encounters particularly, which is parallel to things happening in what we would call the paranormal, that I believe is just part of that spectrum and it's, it's a version of interpretation. Um, people that experience UFO encounters, particularly when researched not through this American style of hypnotic regression and interrogation, really, um, they develop themselves. They develop themselves in a good way. They become more assertive, more positive, more developed. They express themselves through art and other creative forms, which suggests to me that the UFO phenomenon is either something which affects or is being used by them to develop the more artistic side of their brain, which is perhaps latent. Uh, latent in them and it's the same effect that you get when people are reporting ghosts and indeed I've heard ghost reports which are exactly the same as UFO entity reports except that people have a different belief system before they start telling you about it. I've called them ghost-like beings because I didn't know how to describe them in any other way. Uh, it was like a ghost with a head on the top and, and a kind of a body and tail it seemed to come towards me and it seemed to go away but it didn't change size and then it was no longer there and then a more rectangular shaped one came on the other side of the light it was as if it was standing on one corner and if you wanted to describe it as a person with a sheet over his head I suppose you could say well there was the head and the other two corners could have been arms and this was the feet but, uh, and some people have described it as that. I don't think of it as that. I think of it as being another ghost-like shape. If we can start to break this down, we are beginning to see that the paranormal is the release or the uh, in-touchness with certain energies, and the UFO phenomenon is no different to that. I found that my hands were becoming very warm in the palms of my hands, and my fingers started tingling. And I didn't know what that was at all. It usually happened late at night, and, and I, I didn't. Uh, you know, there's no way about it. I had no idea what it was. We'd got a friend who was ill at the time, sadly dying from cancer, who we used to visit. And when I visited him, I always had contact with him. I always kissed him hello and goodbye, held his hand. And I found that after I'd, I'd left him, I felt quite ill for about an hour and a half. And I, I told someone about this one day and she said, oh, you're developing as a healer and I've just been accepted and I'm now a registered healer with the National Federation of Spiritual Healers. Most of the contacts that go on, the so-called contacts, are contacts with our own creative minds, our own subconscious mind. The mind has a, has a whole series of steps if you like and and it's the subconscious which learns a lot about the world but doesn't tell the conscious mind it simply stores it there to protect the conscious mind as and when needed these experiences may be seen threatening and the subconscious brings certain uh, information forward and that's very strange and it feels like an alien contact that would be my interpretation of what is going on here real external paranormal energies we don't understand affecting people who are then using parts of their brain to interpret them that they've never used before and that's where I think we start to create the aliens. But if our minds create the aliens, how do we explain the physical evidence left by extraterrestrial vehicles? Vehicles which allegedly have crashed at various sites around the world. How do we explain alien crash retrieval theories if aliens don't exist? To the question, how do I reconcile my beliefs with crash retrievals, I would throw that question back and say, let's look at the people who believe crash retrievals are right and get them to reconcile their beliefs along with the other stories which people I don't necessarily agree with are also saying. 
in America, we have two stories. We have the abductions and we have the crash retrievals. Now, according to abduction research, these flying saucers are capable of taking people physically through the walls of buildings, and I don't mean through the windows that are open, I mean physically through the walls. They're capable of flying the flying saucers and taking the aliens through physical matter as well. Yet we have a flying saucer in Roswell, let's say, which is knocked down by a bolt of lightning and goes bowling all over the desert. Then we've got aliens that are capable, the same aliens are supposed to be in there. Now, they are capable of doing all these Trans, um, movements with matter, they can sort of transfigure matter there. And yet they can't get their own people back from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. When they make one attempt, they came in over the walls with ray guns shooting. Now, when you can stop a car with four people in it, switch three of them off so that they don't know anything that's going on, and take one person out and abduct them, surely you don't have to come in over the walls of Wright-Patterson with, with guns blazing. Um, they obviously are supposed to have a much higher technology, yet it's the same bug-eyed dome-headed aliens that we hear about. So there seems to be something wrong. I don't have to reconcile crash retrievals with these stories. I don't think they've reconciled it yet in America. The only crash retrieval that we know is true, and I use the word true in inverted commas, is the Roswell crash itself, because we know there was material covered up by the government. We know they paraded false material in order to convince us that the, the, the real stuff was not what was collected. But I would say that happening as it did in 47, right in the middle of the White Sands Proving Grounds, just where they'd finished developing the, the atom bomb in, in the Manhattan Project, it, at the birthplace of the, of the um, American space program, all happening at that time in that area, anything could have been dropped in the desert there, which the government would have wanted to cover up. Arnold's sighting was just a month before, and it was one of those sightings coming as it did in the silly season in the summer, which attracted people's attention you weren't a true star on the American flag if you didn't have flying saucers by the first month after Arnold had seen them. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if even the military didn't join in the fun and cover up one of their own retrievals with some story about flying saucers, never realising the scope of the tiger they'd got by the tail that they then didn't know even how to let go of. Every study that's been carried out by psychologists has shown that witnesses who have these experiences emerge changed in such a way that their personality shows they've gone through an experience which is almost the equivalent of rape. But the difference is, when you've gone through a rape, you can talk to people about it. There are rape counsellors, there are people who understand you, everybody knows it happens, so therefore they can sympathise to a degree with you. Whereas if you've had one of these experiences, you can't talk to anybody because nobody believes it's happened. And, uh, you know, you're treated as if you've simply gone mad. To me, it was, it was the, the, the uh, most profound experience of my life, you know, uh, uh, to suddenly confront these things, you know, a lot of people in the descriptions they act like, well, this isn't all that incredible, you know. But they're they're comparing this with science fiction sorts of things they've experienced. You experience this kind of thing in real life. You're face to face with something. It's not that great of a of a difference between a human being. But to me, the, the, it was just such a incredible shock. But if John Spencer and Jenny Randalls are correct that hypnotic regression is a flawed way to substantiate witnesses' reports, and if there's little other corroborative evidence, are we forced to accept that UFOs and close encounters are all tricks, illusions, bursts of creativity or subconscious energy that we don't understand? That it is the alien within ourselves that reveals itself. Isn't that just as unlikely as the extraterrestrial hypothesis? Simply psychobabble and gobbledygook. More or less objective observers each have their points of view, but the witnesses themselves tell the UFO story. And it's to them that we must go. If we take a train crash, if you run up to, a, to the victims of a train crash that have survived and they're strewn all over the grass and ask them what happened, you're not going to get a coherent and, and good account of what that train crash was, was actually um, what happened. In fact, the most coherent account will come, as crash investigators find, by a researcher moving in and talking to a whole range of people and getting their stories out. Now, why that is effective, of course, is because there is a certain amount of physical evidence and corroborative evidence which supports the stories, and you can, you can know which ones are reliable and which ones are the product of trauma or fantasy. In our case, in abduction research, the problem is we have no model to work to, we have no corroborative evidence, and we don't know what to accept and what not to accept. But we have to believe that, on the basis of reliability, witnesses are not necessarily reliable. So when they say, well, I was there, I saw it, therefore I must be correct, I'm afraid that's just not the case. So much testimony, so many witnesses, so much evidence. 
and in many cases, no explanation. Can we rule out the extraterrestrial hypothesis? Can we rule it in? The experts each have a different point of view. I'm an old-fashioned uh, extraterrestrial man myself. I think that there's sufficient evidence to show that a very small proportion of the sightings do represent some kind of contact with an extraterrestrial technology. We really do not know what UFOs are other than unidentified. You're left with this curious kind of middle ground. The evidence is partly physical. It's also filtered through a human mind, which means therefore it has to become partly psychological as well. Um, and I think one of the problems is we're probably asking the wrong questions. For my view, I'm not even sure aliens are involved at all. It would be extremely naive to suggest they couldn't be. Obviously, that's possible. But um, it doesn't explain to me how you come halfway across the galaxy, um, you come sort of bombing down out of the skies into the middle of the Arizona desert just to hide behind a rock and shout at boo at some passing motorist, which is almost what these people are doing. That even if it is aliens, we must be interpreting it wrongly because it must be more alien than we are capable of interpreting. That is the fascination of UFOs. Despite thousands of cases of ordinary people reporting something extraordinary, the jury is still out. After 45 years of modern research, all it seems we are left with are more complex versions of the very questions that we started with. If there is a connection between UFOs and the strange beings we've heard about, and both are a natural earthly phenomenon that we don't yet understand, then maybe this research will lead us to the answer. If, however, the extraterrestrial hypothesis holds true and we are being visited by creatures from an alien world, then perhaps we will only find the answer when they choose to go public when they choose to reveal their truth to us.